Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. Today, the day after the 102nd anniversary of Armistice Day, we will learn about the Great War and the Iowans who fought on the battlefield and worked on the home front, as well as the war's aftermath. You can learn more about this series and all of our programming on our website at iowaculture.gov history. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend. And don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm happy to introduce our speaker, State Curator Leo Landis. Leo has his Bachelor's, bachelor's of Science in History from Iowa State University and a Master's of Arts in Historical Administration from Eastern Illinois University. He has completed all but his dissertation towards a PhD in history from Iowa State. His museum experience includes time at Living History Farms in Urbandale, Connor Prairie and Fishers, Indiana, and eight years as curator at Henry Ford Museum and Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. He has also worked as curator and director of education at Salisbury House in Des Moines. I'm very happy to turn it over to Leo to begin the webinar. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, of course, to everyone who's joining us live today and appreciate your time. As Jennifer mentioned, yesterday was the 102nd anniversary of the end of World War I, or what was called the Great War at the time, not knowing that there would be uh, equally, if not uh, more so, greater uh, conflict in uh, just a, another decade and, and, and change from that. So let's talk about some of the basics of the uh, World War I or the Great War. It begins on July 28th, 1914. There'd been the assassination uh, in June of 1914 that had uh, provoked the alliances that were part of the European networks uh, in, in Serbia, the assassination in Serbia. And so you have the war starting about a month after that date, and it lasts until November 11th, 1918. And the United States joined on April 6th, 1917. From the United States perspective, you see 4.7 million men and women who serve. On the Iowa side, we had more than 500,000 men, so about a half, more than a half million men who registered, there were a period of registrations, uh, eight, uh, June of 1917, September of 1917, June of 1918, and September of 1918. And through that period, it was men eventually between the ages of 18 to 45 who registered. And there were more than 114,000 men, or Iowans, I should say, who served in US forces. Total, there were 117,000 deaths uh, in U.S. forces. Uh, the number that we use at the State Historical Society is 4,088. The official number from the United States government that you'll see is 3,576. That's really just the men serving in U.S. forces who died. On the State Historical Society side, we count women and men fighting on behalf of Canadian and British forces uh, in our count. So our, our count is more inclusive. And there were more than 5,000 Iowa men wounded during the war. Well, as I said, the war began in 1914, but the US had tried to stay out of the war initially, seeing it as a European conflict. And in fact, President Wilson had campaigned in 1916 with the notion that he kept us out of war. And yet, after about three months after his inauguration, two months after his inauguration, three months after his inauguration, uh, we are involved in World War I, the Great War. Here's the 
Des Moines Evening Tribune, the afternoon paper with the headline on Friday, April 6th. Congress had voted earlier in that week to uh, declare war. And so President Wilson, uh, following the submarining of some additional US uh, transport or shipping ships, uh, felt drawn back into the war. Uh, there'd been the Lusitania a few years before that, uh, British ship with US citizens on it that uh, caused a uh, concern and the Germans had stopped attacking uh, what were perceived to be uh, civilian or uh, peaceful ships of a neutral party, the United States, and resumed that in the spring of 1917. And so that draws us into the war. There also had been a telegram sent to Mexico from uh, a German ambassador stating that if Mexico would attack the United States and if the United States were brought into the war and the United States were to lose or be on the losing side, Germany would see that Mexico had Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and California, the parts that had been part of Mexico, returned to it. And so the United States had learned of that telegram in March via the British and knew that Germany was trying to draw Mexico into the war. And there had been conflict between uh, Mexican raiders and the United States in 1916. So there was that antagonism already. And then as the U-boat attacks are resumed in the spring, that pushes the United States into war. So the April 6th, 1917 date is when the United States officially joins the Allied effort. And with that, uh, a selective service bill is passed. And so there is the initiative to have men between the ages of 21, and I believe it's 35 on this first uh, sign up for selective service. Uh, here you see the draft board for Sioux County uh, the Orange City Draft Board up in Northwest Iowa meeting. And so they would have ledgers of all the men who had signed up, uh, the sign up date, and I'll show you some examples of the registration cards. That happened in June of 1917. And so that's the first selective service registration period with a draft board established in uh, every county at least and in larger communities to have numbers selected to put men into service. You even see the eye chart in the background on this image of the Orange City draft board there. And just uh, always try to give thanks to my colleagues, Mary Bennett in Iowa City and Becky Plunkett in Des Moines for their good work and documenting the, and, and our predecessors, of course, and documenting the Iowa experience. So this is a photograph from our Des Moines collection. Well, here's an example of a draft registration card and it's the front on the left, the back on the right. And you'll note this is a man from Oskaloosa. This is one of my favorite cards in our collection. Uh, it's not in our collection that I learned from another item in our collection. Um, Frank Blattner, he's living in Oskaloosa. Birth date is April 8th, 1890. He's a natural born citizen. He's from living in he was born in Oskaloosa, excuse me. He's a citizen. And then on line seven is his occupation and he's a ball player. And it asks on line eight, who is his employer and where is he employed? And he's working for J.L. Wilkinson and he's based out of Kansas City. Well, J.L. Wilkinson had started a team in the early 19 teens called the All Nations Team where he, and out of Des Moines at this time, that he organized ball players from different cultural backgrounds to play games across the Midwest, mostly Iowa and Missouri, but a little bit uh, Nebraska and, and uh, other states. And so uh, Frank Blattner is part of that team that Wilkinson then moved down to Kansas City. Uh, and after the war, JL Wilkinson then becomes the founding owner of the Kansas City Monarchs. and. Uh, one of our volunteers was working on a project for us. Her name is Lois Crozier. And I had her looking at the honor roll that you see on the right side of the screen. That is a list of black soldiers serving 
uh, from Iowa in the military. And so I'll show you the enlargement of that. And we found Blattner's name. She said, hey, Leo, there's this guy who says he's a baseball player. And it's like, oh my goodness, he's working for J.L. Wilkinson. J.L. Wilkinson's the last Iowan in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, just going back to Blattner then on the back side of his card, you see that he is tall. And when it describes his build, he is stout. Uh, the color of his eyes are brown. The color of his hair is brown. He is not bald. That's the third line or the third uh, section on line two on the back side of the card. And then uh, you have his uh, registration. And he actually, because he's playing baseball, uh, registers early and he registers on June 2nd, 1917. Uh, most men, as I'll show you on another card, uh, were registering on June, June 5th. And so this is an example. You'll also note that the bottom of the card has its corner clipped off uh, lower left on the front side of the card. And so on the back side of the card, it's the lower right. That was the way the US Army segregated soldiers. They would clip that corner and in fact, it's had a cutting line to say, if the soldier is black, clip the corner, let's keep them segregated. So of course, forces are segregated. Uh, blacks in Iowa, especially in central Iowa, were very proud. So they had, and, and proud of their service. So they had that hand-drawn roll of honor of a list of colored soldiers at Camp Dodge and other places. Blattner's name shows up on line 79. That's the third column from the left and the third name down. So uh, it was a list of more than 150 men from central Iowa primarily and southern Iowa who were serving on behalf of the United States and segregated forces. On the far right of that enlargement is the column that lists the officers primarily. And so uh, you see starting with the third name down, some of the, the men who were serving as black officers. This is the first time that the army established a training school for black officers. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit too, but uh, uh, names that might be familiar to some people, uh, Lieutenant James B. Morris is third from the bottom in that column. There's also two dentists that are listed, uh, one below, both below Morris's name. Uh, Lieutenant E.J. Cobb is a dentist and Lieutenant Ralph Tebow. I know Tebow was from uh, Keokuk. He actually gets drafted and called up and he's serving as a regular soldier. They find out that he'd been trained as a dentist at Howard University and they say, oh, he gets made an officer while he's training at Camp Dodge. So uh, he did not go through the training school that we'll talk about in a minute. Well, here's a standard card, though typed very nicely from June 5th, 1917. This is William Richard Mullinger of Denison, Iowa, born July 4th, 1893, natural born citizen. Uh, he was born in Denison. He works as a farmer. He's working for his father uh, in Denison. He has no one who's relying on him for income. Uh, he's single. He is white or Caucasian. He has no other military service, and then he's tall. Uh, his build is slender. His eyes are blue, brown hair. He's not bald. He has no, he's not lost a le arm, leg, hand, foot, or both. Uh, and his eyes are fine, uh, and he is not disabled. Uh, I, he's living in uh, Nishnabotna or Nishnabotni Township in Crawford County. And I thought this was a fun one to, to pull just because uh, it's a West Central Iowa uh, farm boy who does serve. He gets called up, uh, comes back, uh, marries a local woman. Her name is Hazel. I'm blanking on her last name. And then uh, a couple of years after he comes back, they have a daughter named uh, Donna Bell Mullinger, who uh, goes on to be fairly well known. Uh, she changes her name when she goes to uh, Hollywood. Uh, her name is Donna Reed. And so uh, this is Donna Reed's father's registration card. Uh, so fun little, fun little nugget there. And, and he does, he serves, I don't believe he ever went to France, but he, he did get called up. And so was in the American Legion in Denison for a number of years. And the American Indians also from Iowa get called up. And so here you see Jonas Powashik on the left, 
uh, a Meskwaki man from the Pawashik family. Uh, he serves, serves admirably, actually gets employed by uh, Edgar Harlan of the historical department after the war uh, to serve and work at the State Historical Museum uh, into the 1950s. So Jonas Pawashik is one of the Meskwaki men who serves and Billy Jones is another one of the Meskwaki men who serves. That's his registration card. I forgot to point it out on uh, Mulliger's card, but if you do look on Billy Jones's card in that bottom left of the front, it says, if person of African descent, tear off this corner. So that's why Blattner's card was, was clipped like it was. Those were the only people who had their cards singled out were blacks. American Indians did not. So Billy Jones, as you look at his card, I won't go through everything. He's working as a laborer for the Chicago Northwestern Railroad Company. Uh, he's married for race, it does say Indian, but on line 12, that's do you claim exemption from draft? And most of the Meskwaki men, uh, they did serve and they served honorably, but they would say we are not citizens. And by the federal definition of a citizen at this time, they were not classified as citizens. So uh, they did try to assert their rights as, as non-citizens saying, you can't make us sign up, we are not citizens. Nevertheless, the federal government did uh, make Meskwaki and other American Indian men serve uh, in the US forces. And so uh, you can see with the precinct on his card on the backside, uh, it says Sac and Fox Reservation, of course that's settlement is really what it is. It's not a reservation, but uh, there were a number of Meskwaki men who served. We've got a photograph of Billy Jones in our collection as well uh, as the Jonas Pawashik and a, a few other Meskwaki men. So uh, the Meskwaki serve honorably on behalf of the United States as well. And as that effort to get men to sign up is taking place, this is the first time the federal government really engages in a propaganda campaign in a concerted effort to generate support of a cause. And in this case, it's the cause of the Great War. We've got a fantastic collection. These are all examples of posters in our collection. The images were easier to pull from Library of Congress and the Museum of Modern Art, but we have all of these posters in our collection. Uh, you can see the demonization of Germans on the Remember Belgium poster on the left. Uh, Ellsworth Young, the artist who did that one is actually from Albia, trained at the Art Institute of Chicago. And again, this is you know, uh, a demonization of the German Hun soldier leading a very young woman away. Uh, there was a term that was used in, in popular culture at the time uh, describing sexual violence about Belgium. And so when it says, remember Belgium, this had deep connotations in the burning uh, background there. So uh, a 1918 poster, but really gaining, trying to gain efforts to support the war. Uh, the middle poster, I really like this one. Uh, again, we think of Rosie the Riveter in World War II. Well, women were working in the war effort in Iowa and across the nation uh, in industry. I know in Waterloo, there were a handful of women working for the uh, John Deere, excuse me, it's about, it hadn't quite become John Deere until uh, March of 1918. So uh, when they first sign up, they're working for the Waterloo gasoline traction and engine, tractor and engine traction, engine traction, or the Waterloo Gasoline Engine Company. There we go. Uh, so you've got women working in factories in World War I doing jobs that men might have done, but were called up. So that does happen in, in Iowa. Also, you know, the, the woman war worker uh, with the airplane, the biplane in her right hand and the uh, artillery shell in her left. And so uh, seeing women uh, being, uh, you know, maybe getting called to the city. And so you wanna make sure she's living a good moral life. And so support the YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association. And you've got the For Every Fighter, a Woman Worker. So uh, another good example. And then when the war ended in 1918, to bring the men home, there was what was called the Victory Liberty Loan. And so that's the poster on the right. And you see the gold star 
uh, for the honor roll. This is the first time that the uh, gold star was used to denote men who had died in service. It started in Ohio, but really became a common uh, banner in households and that the names are very diverse. And so Dubois or Dubois, that could be both French, but also referencing uh, W.E.B. Dubois, the African-American leader. You see, you know, Smith, O'Brien, Sheka, a Czech name. I've got a friend here in the Cedar Rapids area, Anne Sheka. Uh, so that's how I say that Czech name. Hauk, Papandrikopoulos, uh, Andrasi, Valetto, Levy, so a Jewish sounding name with Levy, Turovich, Kowalski, Krasanovich, Knudsen, so there's a good Scandinavian name, and the last name Gonzalez. So you do see every really continental group represented except for Asians, and there was enough Asian prejudice, I'm sure, that if uh, Howard Chandler Christie, who designed this poster, thought about uh, including an Asian name or may have just excluded it in general on his own. Uh, there was still a good deal of prejudice in many ways, but especially against Asians and, and Blacks. So uh, I do suspect that Du Bois or Du Bois is done to reference African Americans as well, but can't even say that specifically. And as we said, you know, you see Gonzalez is the last name listed. So you have that concerted effort to get people behind the war. The men are signing up in June. They're getting called up in late June, early July. And so this is likely a, a early July uh, photograph from Osage up in North Central Iowa, the county seat of Mitchell County, uh, just north of Mason City. Uh, and so it really was a community event when soldiers were being mustered out. I've read the account of the Keokuk parade that uh, Ralph Tebow, the black man, uh, he leads the parade of black soldiers in Keokuk. So there would be parades in every community, people supporting the war effort uh, beginning in that mid summer or early summer of 1917. And women also were serving in various roles. And as we saw with every, the poster with every uh, woman, a, a war worker, or every, uh, the war worker poster, uh, women were serving in the Red Cross. This is from a collection uh, that we have in our Iowa City materials that, that Mary Bennett turned me on to. And Grace Van Evra uh, serves as a Red Cross nurse into uh, early 1919, actually. Uh, it does go overseas and then comes back and works on the home front in healthcare. So this was a, a chance where women are serving in both on the home front and overseas. Yeah. And Grace Van Evera uses her experience to, to have a career in, as we said, healthcare uh, through the rest of her life. So uh, really broadens some of the opportunities for women in Iowa and, and when they come back. One of the stories that is sometimes overlooked in that is that Iowa women did die in service. Uh, Marion Crandell, born in Cedar Rapids, family moves to the Omaha area when she's a girl. Uh, she then uh, took schooling in France. And so she was very fluent in French. She was actually teaching in Davenport in 1917. And at a girls' school called St. Catherine's that was an Episcopal school in Davenport. And in December, early January, December 1917, early January 1918, feels that her skills as someone who's fluent in French can be helpful. And so she signs up uh, to assist as uh, really a, a worker in uh, field operations in feeding and, and caring for soldiers. And she is stationed in France. And in March, the building where she's working is hit by a German shell. And she's hit by shrapnel and is killed on March 27th, 1918. So uh, it's an Iowa woman who really is the first woman killed in active service uh, in US service. Uh, and, and so uh, 
We'll talk about Merle Hay in a moment, but Marion Crandall is a compelling story to, to know and, and, and recognize as you think about service of Iowa women. Well, I reference Ralph Tebow as being an officer and James B. Morris, uh, that's part of the Iowa contribution on the na national level as well, is that Fort Des Moines on the south side of Des Moines and a little to the west of, of down or on the west side of downtown uh, is where black officers are trained beginning in the summer of 1917 and uh, the army tries to recruit 1200 total men um, because most black whether men or women weren't supported in their educational efforts in the south most of the southern states couldn't meet their quotas to have men sign up but states like Iowa, uh, northern states, uh, really do send some of the uh, best and, and uh, brightest of the black population, young men. So James B. Morris, who had his law degree, uh, was a member of the Iowa Bar. Uh, he signs up and trains at Fort Des Moines. These are the captains on their commissioning out day. They trained through June and July into August in September and October 15th, 1917, then they are commissioned out to go to their next posts. And so some of them do go up to Camp Dodge actually and train some of the black soldiers who are training at Camp Dodge in the fall of 1917. And Camp Dodge, of course, had started as an army camp in the late 1900s. 1900s, uh, I think it's around 1906, 1907, 1908, Camp Dodge is really taking off, uh, but not to the degree that happens beginning in 1917. Uh, we know that people like Edward Fleur, who were part of the Iowa National Guard, uh, had trained at Camp Dodge in the 19 teens before going down to Mexico uh, to deal with the border difficulties that I had referenced. And so in 1917, as we enter the war, construction really takes off. Uh, there was a rail line that was on the west edge of Camp Dodge. So this is the camp looking uh, from uh, the west edge, looking to the northeast or to the east up to the hillside there. And <clears throat> so building really takes off. Uh, you had you know, tens of thousands of men at any one time at Camp Dodge, I think around 40,000 uh, would have been typical. I know it was more than 30,000 anyway, and uh, even a larger capacity than that. So Camp Dodge really takes off. And as I said, you had both white and black soldiers training at Camp Dodge through 1917 and 1918 uh, with uh, the forces being segregated, but both on site. Just another example, and, and the YMCA really did play a major role both in uh, care and concern. Uh, not sure why the duffel bags and other suitcases were being unloaded outside the YMCA building there, uh, but uh, organizations like the YMCA, the Salvation Ar Army, uh, were trying to, Knights of Columbus, uh, the Catholic men's organization, were being supportive of the soldiers at YMC at uh, Camp Dodge. And so uh, YMCA had a group of secretaries as well that I'll show you here in a second. And there you see the YMCA secretaries, they would man the building and uh, there was likely a segregated building. And that's why you see the black man in the foreground of this photograph. That's probably Hutcherson who's listed or Hutchison who's listed on the uh, roll of honor that I showed earlier. He went on to continue to work for the Y after the, uh, after the war ended, uh, working in Oklahoma, if I remember right. And so uh, the Y was trying to enforce proper uh, moral behavior by the men at camp. Uh, and so they had a reading room, uh, other Christian activities to make sure that the, the men were uh, maintaining their moral uh, health as well as their physical health. 
And so that was part of the, the role of the YMCA. Uh, as we said, groups like the YMCA, Salvation Army, uh, Knights of Columbus were supporting soldiers. The main national welfare group, uh, in addition to the Salvation Army, was the Red Cross. And so a really great shot of the Red Cross uh, women workers and men uh, supporting soldiers being uh, commissioned out, probably headed to Camp Dodge, possibly down to Camp Funston in Kansas. Uh, and having donuts and snacks were, were typical. Salvation Army was known for serving donuts and, and Red Cross as well. So the Red Cross, both at home and overseas, was playing a role in the welfare of soldiers uh, across the United States. And not only were uh, adults involved in war work, but there was a junior Red Cross. I'm not positive that these, this was a junior Red Cross club that was then uh, engaged in exercises uh, promoted by the War Camp Community Service Group in Des Moines. But you do, you see the Red Cross uh, signs in the background. I'm not sure if this is taking place uh, at uh, the Jewish Center in Des Moines that was supportive of black activities or not. But uh, one of my favorite photographs in our collection uh, from here in Des Moines. And, and so the Junior Red Cross was active in small towns and large cities uh, in making blankets, uh, making gowns for war orphans, and also promoting activities that encouraged good health like exercises. So uh, that was both a social and philanthropic organization and, and towns would be very proud and there would be uh, competitions within counties on, you know, who could make the most uh, layettes, a gown for a, uh, a gown for a baby uh, or a toddler, or could make uh, knitted gloves, knitted hats for soldiers or people that needed things in Europe. And so the Junior Red Cross was uh, a way for young people across the state to support the war effort. And I had referenced Merle Hay when I was talking about Marion Crandall. That's a name a lot of Iowans known. Uh, Merle Hay is in France. And on November 3rd, 1917, while he was on duty, uh, the Germans attacked, uh, snuck in, attacked uh, the American troops. And so there were three men killed that day uh, or that evening. Merle Hay of Glidden, Iowa, Jefferson County, in right, and I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his first name, of Pennsylvania, and then Grissom of Indiana. I was talking to Mike Vogt of the Iowa Gold Star Military Museum. He said there's at least some testimony uh, from someone who was on sentry duty that night who claimed that uh, he heard Hay get attacked, and it was earlier than the other two, but there really is no definitive knowledge on which of those three men Merle Hay, Enright, or Grissom was killed first. So best to think of Merle Hay as one of the first three Americans uh, killed serving with US forces because there are actually Iowa men who are killed before Merle Hay, but they're serving with British forces or Canadian forces. And then just as the, the bookend to that, he's not the only one who is killed on November 11th, but there were a number of soldiers who because the armistice was being sold as not certain on November 11th, 1918, were on duty. And Wayne Miner, who was a coal miner working out of Centerville, but when he enlisted on his registration card or signed up, uh, he was living in a small town called Diamond, uh, was, was where he was living with his parents. And his uh, job was a coal miner in Centerville. Uh, he is killed on Armistice Day. And so uh, Appanoose County has a, a nice memorial arch at their cemetery, and he's one of the men recognized on their memorial arch. And just to call to mind the sacrifice and, and the efforts done by these men, here's a photograph of Private, uh, excuse me, Corporal William Parmley, who is uh, 
serving out of Jasper County and is killed in service and earned the Distinguished Service Cross. But then you see on the right an account of uh, and another Jasper County soldier. And I just like that account. And, and in the case of Parmley, uh, he's the first Jasper County person to be killed in active duty. And so usually the Legion Halls then or other places, uh, for example, Brummett Bridge down in Page County is named uh, after a soldier from Page County who's the first one to die. And the Iowa Highway Commission was working on a new bridge. And so the bridge across the Mishnabotna River uh, in Clorinda is, is named uh, for, for Brummett. Uh, and so Legion Halls and, and sometimes other uh, landmarks would be named for the the first men or early men to die. But looking at Private David Paul's account and who was killed in uh, June of 1918, saying that Private David Paul died of wounds, received an action. Corporal, Corporal William B. Parmley was killed in action. How carelessly we repeat these words, little thinking or reflecting what it means to make this sacrifice. We wish we did not have to eat war bread. We think war tax on train fares, theaters, etc., a source of great inconvenience. We cannot buy flour as we once did. Our supply of sugar is limited. We are asked to buy liberty bonds, war saving stamps, contribute to the Red Cross, the YMCA, etc. It seems we are asked to do much. But how little, how insignificant, how trifling are these things to the sacrifice Private Paul and Corporal Parmley had Parmley made and uncomplainingly at that. Let us hope that the sacrifice these brave Jasper County men have may, made may not have been made in vain. Let us adjust ourselves to the conditions as we find them and may we strive on toward the mark of a world worldwide freedom of humanity. So really that recognition of sacrifice and saying what we're doing on the home front pales in comparison to uh, the men like David Paul and William Parmley and just a, a really compelling account as to how uh, Iowans and people across the country were being called to recognize the efforts of the men serving overseas. In addition to uh, infantry soldiers and Marines, this was the first war where the airplane really becomes significant. And so here you see James Norman Hall of Colfax. He had attended uh, Grinnell College, Colfax, if you're uh, not a central Iowan is in Jasper County, just east of uh, just east of Des Moines on Interstate 80. Uh, it had had a hot springs, and so uh, or uh, springs, I should say. I don't know that they were hot, but it had mineral waters, and uh, so it was was a, a well known town at the time. And uh, a Hall first enlists in Canadian forces, as some men did, and he claimed Canadian citizenship. That was found out. Uh, and so he was asked to leave Canadian forces. Then when uh, the U.S. joins the war, he joins the Lafayette Escadrille, the United States men who are pilots and, and serving. So that is Hall at his airplane in the right image. And he actually was, was shot down and captured, I believe, twice. Uh, the second time being, uh, I believe it's, it's June of, might be May 1918, and this was a, a photograph in our collections here in Des Moines that uh, Hall had. It was given to him by a German officer. So it was taken by a German officer uh, after he's been captured, having been shot down. And there you see him with a dachshund. So uh, Hall goes on to have a, a well-known literary uh, career uh, with a, a colleague. Uh, I think it's uh, Nordhoff, Charles Nordhoff. Um, and, and ends up writing uh, a number of well-known known works. So uh, Iowans are serving as pilots. Uh, we've got a, a uniform from Russell Merrill of Polk County, who is a well-known pilot as well. Uh, we do have some of James Norman Hall's uh, uh, uniforms as well in our Des Moines collection. Well, in addition to the service uh, and, and the concerns happening during the war, the largest population of immigrants in Iowa history are people with ancestry in Germany. And since we were at war with Germans, there was a lot of anti-German sentiment. And in fact, in uh, 
May of 1918, Governor William Harding, uh, with a proclamation that was done on May 23rd, creates what sometimes gets called the Babel Proclamation. Uh, I've only seen that in one account in the war period, so I'll usually call it the English-only proclamation. Babel Proclamation was not a term used in the 1918 uh, period that, that I can see in any uh, larger format. It was a post-war term uh, describing it. So uh, the English-only proclamation uh, really gets laid out on, on page two, the back side of the, or the second page of the proclamation saying, first, English should and must be the only medium of instruction in public, private, denominational, or other similar schools. Second, conversation in public places on trains and over the telephone should be in English language, in the English language. Third, all public addresses should and must be in the English language. Fourth, let those who cannot speak or understand the English language conduct their religious worship in their homes. And Des Moines, uh, especially uh, the Danish communities of Audubon and Shelby County, uh, and the Dutch communities, both in Jasper and Marion and uh, Sioux County. You have lots of foreign languages, Swedish around Stanhope and, and other Swedish communities. Uh, you have thousands of Iowans who are not used to hearing English in their schools and their worship services, and who often talk over the phone to their friends and relatives in whatever their first language was. And so this is highly controversial. Uh, it was an executive order, and uh, it did stay in effect through December of 1918, uh, was enforced mostly uh, with uh, a degree of uh, lack of enforcement in some communities, uh, but really was disruptive for many, many communities across the state and uh, never had a ruling on whether it was constitutional or not, but the anti-war or the anti-German sentiment was strong enough that uh, most people supported it unless you were a Dane or a Swede uh, or a Norwegian uh, who didn't speak English. And, and even some Germans who didn't speak English, uh, in fact, a lot of Germans who didn't speak English were, were uh, offended by this because they felt they were patriotic islands. And so it did cause disruption across the state and the enforcement was at times uneven. <clears throat> there was a group of uh, citizen organizations, men, who acted locally to try to enforce it. It was a national uh, group, but had local organizations that, that helped uh, a protective league that, that tried to help enforce this and, and often would be the recipients of complaints. But there were also a number of complaints sent to uh, Governor Harding himself. And this is one, uh, Glenn Erstein, who's a professor at University of Iowa in the German language, uh, worked with some students to digitize some of the state archives collections. So this is one out of Dubuque County, a little postcard sent to Governor Harding saying, Your Excellency, in one of the churches in Dubuque, the pastor insists on using the German, on using, uh, the German for at least a part of every service. It seems to me it <clears throat> would be better to eliminate all German. America is good enough to live in. It is good enough to be all American. Then on the back side of the card it says, this pastor is Father, I think it's William uh, Heinrich, if I remember right, of the Holy Ghost Church. Pastor's address is 3125 Cooler Avenue, Dubuque, Iowa. I am a member of this parish and attend the Holy Ghost Church. Please do not use my name in communication with the affair. And then she signs it uh, very sincerely, Mrs. Catherine Sullivan Laughlin. So this gets at some of the tension between Irish Catholics and German Catholics and Catherine Sullivan Laughlin with a very Irish name is not happy that her uh, Catholic priest with German uh, ancestry is using the German language to talk to some of his parishioners because the mass is in Latin, but uh, apparently some of his messages to the congregation are, are done in German. And so she's 
uh, reporting out on her own priest in her community. So that was the level of uh, concern that you saw across the state where a parishioner at a Catholic church would send a postcard on her own uh, priest. Well, this is going back to the war effort overseas, the war where machine guns are really perfected. Hiram Maxim, who was a U.S. by birth, but then moved to England, creates the Maxim machine gun that was both portable and stationary. Uh, you see the trench here. These are German soldiers. The Germans had really early with the militaristic effort uh, seen that Maxim's machine gun was, was really effective and efficient. And so it could shoot uh, over 400 rounds in a minute. So about, uh, I think, six or seven shells uh, a second uh, would be shot. And so terribly devastating. You also have tanks being used for the first time, uh, both on the German and the Allies side. And so uh, motorized both with automobiles and trucks, but also now with tanks are a new weapon. And so you get a whole new level of destruction in, in warfare through World War I. Well, <clears throat> as I, I referenced, uh, November 11th, uh, 1918, the uh, Allied forces, the British, French, and, and U.S., and, and others, there were Africans serving uh, on behalf of the, the Allies as well, uh, were really uh, making headway through August and September into October. Uh, things are, are looking more and more promising, and so... <clears throat> got a typo I see on this slide. It says May 15th, 1918. That's May 15th, 1919. Uh, the armistice takes place on November 11th, 1918. Most of the soldiers through that Victory Liberty loan aren't coming back then until the spring of 1919. And in Des Moines, a temporary Victory Arch is built on Locust Street and the uh, Iowa soldiers who had been in the 168th Infantry, the Rainbow Division, uh, have a parade on May 15th, 1919, and they march through that Victory Arch. So it would be not too far from uh, the historical building, uh, perhaps halfway up toward the Capitol, as, as Locust Street uh, would have taken you uh, up, up to the Capitol steps at that time. And the Victory Arch was up through August of 1919, so it was up from uh, May of 1919 to August of 1919. And men were welcomed home. Uh, people were excited that the war was over. There were celebrations uh, in November uh, 1918 on, on Armistice Day. And so uh, the war ends. Soldiers, for the most part, are back home and then mustered out, released from military service by June of 1919. But not all is well in our state and in uh, the nation. You see a, a re really a sense of nativism uh, coming to the fore, that anti-immigrant sentiment uh, to a degree uh, related toward Germans, but also uh, you see the most restrictive immigration act passed in the 1920s and 1924, up to that time anyway. Uh, you also see uh, a reaction against modernism uh, automobiles, movies, uh, dancing, uh, jazz music are all issues of concern. And so when uh, candidate Harding runs, not Governor Harding of Iowa, but Warren G. Harding of Ohio runs on the Republican ticket in 1920, his uh, real is, uh, his, his motto is to return to normalcy. And so get away from all this new thing, these new things happening. Let's go back to normalcy. And, and this is manifested in Iowa where the Ku Klux Klan comes to the fore. Uh, you do, you see uh, local statutes about jazz music and the modern dances that are take, taking place, concerns about the sort of content in movies. And so this sense of a nation at risk to these new forces really comes, comes to the fore. And so here's a letter from a, a woman named Edith Tinkham written on May 10th, 1920 to Governor Harding. So the war has been over for a year and a half. And she writes, esteemed sir, 
am taking the liberty of writing you for information. I believe during the war, you issued a proclamation barring the talking of all foreign languages in the state of Iowa. As, and we hadn't ratified, and never did ratify the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, as a state of war still exists, does that law still hold good? As I said, Governor Harding had repealed that order in uh, December of 1918. So it was not in effect, but she says, the reason I am asking is <clears throat> we are living in a German community and they are speaking German on the streets and in public places to the boys who have been overseas and to every underlined, to any, I should say, and to any loyal American citizen, this is very obnoxious. Are we as citizens obliged to stand this and say nothing? Very sincerely, Edith Tinkham, uh, she lives in Sutherland up in O'Brien County in Northwest Iowa, but the Klan and the anti-German uh, and especially the anti-immigrant uh, sentiment was was prevalent across the state. And so uh, that's what sets America up in the 1920s as German militarism takes place in the 1930s then for a resistance against uh, modernism, but also against the, the war that begins in 1939 with the invasion of Poland. And so those are some of the forces that come out of the uh, end of World War I or the Great War. Well, one of the projects we did connected to that is, is as I mentioned, Becky Plunkett uh, earlier. She's our special collections archivist here in Des Moines. She let me know that we had uh, in 1920 tried to document photographs of all the Iowans, men and women uh, in both US and foreign forces who died in service. And so uh, with our state archivist, Tony Jan and our uh, one of our marketing staff at the time, Abby Friedmeier, we were able to digitize all those images and really make the wall of honor of Iowans who died in uh, World War I. And so it's done by county and is a temporary display that we've loaned out across the state. Uh, we're loaning it out until the pandemic took place. And so uh, really proud of the work that my colleagues did to uh, digitize the photos of all the Iowa women and men that we know of. And, and we've even discovered a handful more on the women's side that, that aren't recognized. But that's a temporary display we have that we did for the World War I centennial. And there is a spreadsheet. It's, you can't change it. You can't download it, but you can view it that uh, is sortable. And so I've got the, the URL there. You can use tinyurl.com, iowaww1-honor roll. Uh, that will take you to the, the website and then you'll want to click the casualties tab. And so this honors those 4,000 plus Iowans who died in service. Uh, again, it's not everyone who served, it's the Iowans who died in service. And so uh, really, as I said, was, was grateful uh, for the effort of, of our colleagues in special collections and, and the state archives to uh, recognize and create this reference of, of Iowans who died in service. And so with that, I'll say thank you and uh, remind you that our next program is coming up on December 10th. And I'm ready for questions when you are, Matt. Uh, thank you, Leo. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions at this time. However, before I pose our first question, I wanna remind our participants that you can still submit your questions through the Q&A feature. However, we are on a schedule. So please note we may not be able to get to all the questions before the end of the webinar. And here's our first question, Leo. So wars typically bring on many new technological advances and inventions. Were there any important technological changes during the war? And do you have a favorite? Uh, well, hard to say a favorite. I think the one that uh, is just coming in, I mean, the experiments had been done, but this is what really introduces, and I didn't talk about this in modernism and the forces of modernism in the 1920s, but uh, it's the first war where the radio is used. And so, uh, shortly after the war, uh, the radio, uh, and, and men were familiar with it for using communication during the war. So uh, it sets the first, you know, mass broadcast shared media experience we have in the 1920s with, with the radio. So I think that's, that's one of those that we often overlook uh, in, in the World War I experiences, the, the beginnings and, and use of radio. And that was one of the things with Meskwaki, uh, not in World War I, but in World War II, their, their 
uh, able to use the radio as code talkers and use their Meskwaki language to talk in secret. So that wasn't a World War I factor, that was a World War II radio factor. Uh, was this the first conflict where propaganda was created by the US government? And how did the war propaganda impact public opinion of the war? Uh, <clears throat> it really is the first mass effort for propaganda. Uh, you know, you had newspapers in the 1890s, I should say, with the uh, Remember the Maine and the Spanish-American War as a vehicle with the yellow journalism uh, to marshal sentiment for the Spanish-American War. But it wasn't so much the government's effort uh, to, to create the publications. And so with the, the war posters, they were printed by the thousands uh, you know, we have four or five of the Remember Belgium poster. We have four or five of the Americans All poster. That YMCA, YWCA is a little more uncommon, uh, but it was very effective. Uh, you know, the sentiment against Germans, uh, Iowans, and, and people across the country had their buildings attacked. Uh, Aldo Leopold, who is the well-known United States environmentalist, his uh, dad and uncle had a factory in Burlington that had yellow paint splashed on it. I think it was late August of 1918 because uh, they didn't let their workers off for a parade. And the Leopolds said, you know, we were trying to help the war effort by keeping our men at work and we have you attacking our, our building. Uh, in towns across the state, you had Germans being singled out. And so it really did raise the patriotism to a level in many time instances that was unreasonable. Uh, and, and so I'd say it was sometimes too effective. So very effective. It, it helped, as I said, uh, with the Liberty Loan and the Victory Liberty Loan to, to support the war effort. And this will be our last question for today. Uh, but what roles did Fort Des Moines and Camp Dodge play in training of black soldiers during World War I? Uh, extremely significant. So the black officers were almost exclusively trained at Fort Des Moines in the summer and, and early fall of 1917. So uh, that's part of the reason it's a National Historic Landmark, also the wax being trained in World War II at Fort Des Moines. But for the first time, the United States Army makes a concerted effort to train black officers. So uh, hard to overestimate its importance or overstate its, its importance. And then Camp Dodge, both for blacks and whites, there are camps all over the country, uh, mostly uh, <clears throat> black soldiers being trained both as officers and as uh, soldiers in the North. And so I know some black soldiers were trained like a Camp Grant in Rockford, not sure about Camp Funston in uh, Kansas, but the view was, you didn't want to have uh, African Americans being trained to use guns in the South, and so that it was more safe to use uh, Northern camps as the locations to train Black soldiers. Uh, we'll include it in our, our list, but there's a, a really tragic case of uh, some Black soldiers who uh, were engaged in illegal activity charged in, in a rape and convicted in a court martial who are hung at Camp Dodge. Uh, I'd heard from Robert Morris, uh, his grandfather always felt like that was not a fair trial. I know that uh, Mike Vogt has, has uh, looked at that too and, and his work as the curator at the Gold Star Military Museum and, and has other opinions. There's a really good Annals of Iowa article on that that we'll include in the email tomorrow. And uh, just with that, that's probably want to say, you know, thanks again to everyone. And, and really, uh, Iowa did play a, a major role in training and, and uh, supporting the war effort. And so I uh, was pleased to be able to share those stories with you today. Well, thank you, Leo. Uh, with that answer, this is all the time we have for today's webinar. I know I say this every single time, but it's always been a very informative lunch. Also, thank you to everyone joining us today. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinar on December 10th. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. And for more information and to register for future webinars in this series, 
check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can look into some of our other fantastic digital programs, such as the Goldies Kids Club activities for young historians, uh, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Story Series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. We look forward to virtually seeing you here again on December 10th. Thank you.